welcome everyone. Um, this is the 31st and final Future Tense Social Distancing Social. Uh, we have been holding these since mid-March uh, and because this is our last one, I actually want to start uh, by thanking all of our New America events and production staff who have worked really hard over 31 uh, different events uh, to make sure that we can do them when we are all uh, wherever we happen to be located. Uh, and just to remind you that Future Tense is a partnership between Slate and Arizona State University and New America. Uh, and it, we explore the impact on, of technology on society and on policymaking. So uh, you just you can follow Future Tense's content on Slate's website and also on Twitter. Uh, and you just heard uh, the details of the Zoom webinar. So our topic today is Will 2020, <laughs> that roller coaster year that we're not even quite yet half through, uh, Will 2020 Change American Tech? And it's been a, a, a roller coaster. If you just think about where we were in January to March to now, uh, the year starts with the Democratic primaries still in full swing with Elizabeth Warren calling and Bernie calling for breaking up uh, big tech. Uh, then through the, uh, the onset of the pandemic, we become ever more dependent, certainly on the tech we're using right now, uh, all the, the different uh, versions of how we can virtually communicate and hang out, and also on Amazon and other e-retail uh, to deliver all sorts of goods. And then with uh, the social justice protests with the murder of George Floyd and a renewed focus on systemic racism, uh, we've also seen a wave of opposition to hate speech, to what it, how uh, content is being moderated. Uh, and of course, we've got tracing apps uh, for how we're gonna control the pandemic going forward. So there've been some good things, there've been some bad things. Uh, we, in many ways, have also seen an acceleration to the future of work. Uh, and we're still in an election year, which is given uh, the role of certainly Facebook uh, and Twitter in electing uh, Donald Trump, that's part of the mix. So we're gonna be talking about what's the balance? Uh, was, is this a good year or a bad year for tech? Too soon to tell. And what are the other implications? We have a wonderful uh, interviewee, Reid Hoffman, uh, who is the co-founder of LinkedIn, uh, who's a partner uh, at Greylock Ventures, a venture capital firm, and most importantly, although that doesn't mean we'll give him an easy time, a board member at New America. Uh, so Reid, welcome, uh, and thanks so much for doing this. Uh, I, I, want, I do wanna start just by asking you to give, give us your sense of what that balance is. If you think about sort of the, the tech clash that wasn't just this year, it's been last year as well as this year, uh, then, then the pandemic, the role of the tech companies, big tech we're talking about in the, in, um, uh, through the, the COVID. And then again, now suddenly uh, the role of social media platforms in particular, advantaging social movements in some ways, but also the tension around hate speech. So just give us your starting sort of overview. So um, I think that uh, we are broadly still, unfortunately, in tech lash. And I say that unfortunately not because I don't think there are obvious and definitive ways that the tech industry can, needs to improve how it uh, functions within society, within democracy, um, within various kind of questions around, um, you know, the ethics around technology for, for example, racial justice or other kinds of things. And I think there's, you know, there's definite, you know, substantial room for improvement there. But, you know, as you know, um, my point of view is that, look, if almost anything that you care about for betterment in the future, whether it's climate change, whether it's, you know, economic justice and, and kind of uh, creation of, new economic opportunity, um, whether it's, you know, um, you, you literally uh, probably even racial uh, justice, uh, there's a strong technological component. And so where, where the tech clash becomes kind of anti-technology 
it becomes a serious problem. Now, when it's a, look, we would prefer the, the, the tech firms to do X versus Y in the following way, I think that's part of a, a good part of a society and a, and a democracy. But if it's just like shut down technology, shut down you know, our ability to be global competitors, just, just shut it down, it, it's actually in fact doing substantial more harm uh, than good. Um, and I think we're still in it. And I think the only reason why, we're, why it's not as immediately apparent that we're in it uh, is because of pandemic, um, the, 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 the clarity of like our civil rights movement version two, uh, hopefully in this time actually in fact really catching. Now, of course, part of what enables uh, this take of the civil rights movement was the fact that we have smartphones and cameras. And we can say, oh my God, that is like evil and terrible and we should do something about it. And it isn't just a, oh no, no, you're just talking about it. It's like, I can see it. Uh, and so it's part of the, the benefit that technology uh, can bring in these circumstances. Uh, and so we're just not seeing as much the tech clash, which I think is just still there, you know, behind the whole thing because the attention is on public health and, 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 and it's, you know, it's ongoing, you know, train wreck disaster. The economic income, uh, impacts of the pandemic, which, you know, GDP down by 30, 30 plus percent when previously a quarter rise was one, you know, and obviously disproportionately hitting, um, you know, uh, communities of color, uh, service industry, you know, lower income Americans, you know, just, just, just terrible. And uh, of course, uh, a, a political system uh, where it's operating, where the, you know, the president is emphasizing reality television and discord and nothing regards to a intelligent response to these crises that we're in. So let's, so, so yeah, so we are still in, in tech lash. I, I, would, I would agree with that. Uh, but let's go somewhere in between the Luddite sort of view. So my son, my 23-year-old son, who gave up his iPhone for a smart for a flip phone halfway through college, he's in the, you know, he writes letters with stamps, which is something that neither of his father and I have done for 10 years. So there's that, the sort of anti-tech, back to the land, back to some mythical past. Um, and then there's the Silicon Valley sort of, or all embrace. What about that intermediate position of, nope, it's big tech we don't like. We're all for tech, but we don't like big tech. And big tech has gotten even bigger in this moment, right? The Amazon has gotten bigger. We, we are more dependent on than ever on the, those really big firms. What about, are we seeing any shift there? Um, I don't think we are. Um, although, once again, I'd say our point, my, my view about what we, where we as a society should be on the big tech question should be, look, we, we, we live in a multipolar world. We have intensifying competition for American economics, American uh, power and prestige, uh, American influence on the world order. Uh, the tech industry is actually one of the places where we have a, a very strong position, although the Chinese competition is coming hard and fierce, and I think there will be uh, even broader than that. And so I think our view that even though it's, I think, a fact that big tech continues to compound at these very high scales, our question shouldn't be the, okay, how do we go hit big tech with a stick? It should be the, how do we make it better for our American democracy, American society, American values to the world? And what is the ways that we interact in order to make that happen? Um, and, and, and that's unfortunately, I think the tech lash against big tech is still basically like there in the same muddled way it was in the last couple of years before the pandemic. Uh, because, you know, you have this weird bivalence of both, ooh, you know, I know that like Google is doing something with my data uh, or, you know, like I know that like, they're, like I see all these bad headlines, but on the other hand, you know, your son, very rare, trade back to flip phones. I'm okay. not even sure I was aware you could get a flip phone in the country still. It's hard. <laughs> um, but, you know, very most people go, oh, my God, I love my smartphone. Oh, my God, I love my free search. You know, oh, my God, I use social networks and I use communication tools and, and this enables me and I, I, I really like it. But I know that there's, I, you know, I, I have some, you know, impression that there's something bad with these tech firms. 
Um, and then, by the way, it doesn't mean that I'm not meaning the tech firms are they like not making mistakes of various forms and are there isn't a better way for our society to have a dialogue with them to improve where our society is in terms of shaping what's going on, or probably most centrally within democracy. But then there's also questions about artificial intelligence, the question about you know which kind of development of which systems, like if it perpetuates racial and bias, you know the the, rach, the racial bias and judicial and other kinds of systems terrible. Like no no no, <laughs> you really need to fix that. And so uh, anyway, so I think that the the big tech lash is still there. Again, not as much paid attention to, not as much top of news headlines, because the top of news headlines are so uh, uh, um, occupied with, oh my gosh, our society, an asteroid has hit the well-functioning, well, it wasn't necessarily well-functioning before, but whatever degree was functioning before was really well compared to where it is now. Yeah. So I want to. I'm gonna. We're gonna come back to talking about some of the questions of algorithmic bias and and some of the more more specific questions. But I want to push you on the the competition with China point. And this is a, probably a place you and I may disagree. So the there's no question, right? There, U.S. and China are the big tech competitors. The EU is a a competitor in tech regulation, but much less in actually having its own homegrown tech companies. And we'll see with India and others, but. So the argument often is, and you alluded to it, look, China's huge, right? We got Alibaba, we got Tencent, Baidu, these are enormous companies. We can only compete with them if we're enormous too. I guess the, so, so there are a group of people at New America saying what we actually need, there's the Chinese model of the internet where you know the, the government can do pretty much whatever it wants. There's a lot of regulation of how Chinese companies actually interact with Chinese consumers, but it's basically an authoritarian vision of what the internet is and an increasing surveillance society. There's the European view, which is highly, very protective of privacy, but also, um, you know, given Europe's own experiences with the state, um, you know, really very, very nervous, more so than most Americans. And that what we actually need is not to just free our co uh, companies to compete with China unrestricted, but we need our own distinctive American vision of what the internet and what, what a, a virtual world, a digital world looks like that builds in privacy, equality, a measure of justice that, that actually, we know what we don't want, but we don't have a positive view of what we do want. Well, so I think, I don't, I think at that level of description, I probably agree with you. Um, my one asterisk would be that uh, to some degree, your ability to imbue the tech platforms of the world with your value structure depends a lot on, on being able to get very broad adoption. Um, so for example, you know, while we can have this discourse about like, well, what should um, kind of social media and communications clients uh, uh, kind of be when we're trying to uh, return our democracy to a healthy state where we think that they're actually, in fact, discourse is leading towards increasing belief and truth in various ways. And you say, well, what would our discourse be like if our communications platform were Tencent, right, versus the ones that we have? And the answer is very different because our ability to influence it would be actually, in fact, a lot less. Um, and that's actually, of course, one of the reasons why uh, the Europeans are, are, you know, deeply concerned about the global strength of the U.S. tech industry because they're like, well, we have these values and, and, and we have a very limited ability to influence it because the, the firms that are creating the platforms that we're operating on are all based in, you know, the West Coast of the U.S. Uh, versus, versus here. And, you know, look, I'm, I'm sympathetic, and I think that there's, there, we're much closer to the European in a variety of value systems. And so I think that, that that's a navigable thing. But that's the reason why uh, I do take as primary making sure that you have the, the kind of winning tech ecosystem. Because without that, you can talk as much as you like, and there's very little you can do, <laughs> right? So now, that being said, do I say, do I want a Chinese, you know, uh, ecosystem? You know, as the one that 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 is the one that we're 
trying to build our you know, a, a system of progressive and liberal values. I don't mean that as anti-conservative. I mean that as kind of a traditional American sense of, uh, of a set of values. No, 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 <laughs> right? We want those and we want to have the right discourse and that the, the ethical tempo of it should be by a well-functioning society and should be by a well-functioning government. Uh, now, how do we get to a well-functioning society and a well-functioning government are a very big and challenging problem. But like the question about like, well, where, where should individual liberties and privacy be and where should that be against society and what, what uh, function should a government have in this and what kinds of things is uh, on limits and off limits for companies to build. Those are really good questions that should, that, that need development. But like, again, like for example, if you were, you know, let's go to an, another country of great values, you go to New Zealand and say, okay, well, you can, you know, you can say, well, we think is what the following things are what should be true of all internet browsers. Well, that's very nice. You know, great country, very wonderful, wonderful people, wonderful government, wonderful country, not gonna mean anything. Okay, so, I mean, you know, it's interesting. I was thinking about, uh, uh, you could imagine American tech companies competing against Chinese companies around the world on we can safeguard your privacy better, right? And there are there are many people, you know, that is something we should be able to compete on. On the other hand, of course, from our own government's point of view, we have not hashed that out. In other words, Apple would say that. Um, there are many people, not New America, but there are others who, who would say, but that, but that compromises our security. So there is this interplay between domestic, uh, you know, the domestic trade-offs. And I take your point of, of if you want to, if you want the world, uh, um, if you want to spread the values, you've also got to spread the system, but you also have to make sure the system <laughs> reflects the values. Yeah. Let, let me, pu let me push on the, the big medium. Um, so again, the, the, the counter vision that we have not seen, except maybe in a few cases is yeah, we, we definitely do need to compete with China, but we could have multiple smaller interoperable systems rather than the, this is the baby bells argument. Um, I, I guess I want to sharpen that question though by asking, so we're on Zoom, right? Zoom was not, <laughs> you know, Microsoft has its teams. You're on the board of Microsoft. Microsoft has its teams. We got Google Hangout. We got, I don't, I don't use the Facebook products, but whatever they are. Zoom, in my experience, is really better. So d d is Zoom a kind of one-off or is this actually an example of the argument that no, you, you can compete even if you are smaller. You really, you just have to you know, seize that market niche. Because one of the most compelling uh, arguments I always find is that you know, so many of the startups are at, on, in Silicon Valley are just waiting to get bought. They don't actually want to build and, and, and create a whole new uh, ecosystem. But Zoom, Zoom's a, right now, you're seeing a company grow very, very fast that wasn't a big company. So, uh, and by the way, it's not just Zoom. I mean, uh, there's Slack, uh, yeah, yeah. you know, in the previous thing. There is, um, uh, you know, like people said, oh, dominance of, of Facebook and then Snap came about. You know, there, 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 there's a stack of things. And I think that the thing that the, the most of the folks in, in kind of antitrust thinking haven't made two important upgrades in their thinking. One of them we've already talked about a little bit, which is global. Like this is not an American run universe anymore. And so as it were, the so goes America, so goes the rest of the world is not actually the way it plays. So you kind of say, well, look, it, uh, it, it looks like it's dominant here. So we should try to unwind it. And then think about like, is China gonna go say, oh, we're gonna go break apart Tencent, <laughs> right? And the answer is not really. Um, and by the way, I don't think the Europeans would do it either if they had it as well. Um, I think it's kind of the question of, of, the, of, of that kind of competition. Then the second thing is, is that, you know, while we have, call it, you know, five plus large tech firms, I think that's five plus large tech firms going to 10, not going to two to three. And when you have a number of them that they're all competing really ferociously with each other, that competition creates lots of space, not just in the competition between the large firms themselves, but for startups. So, you know, why is it that, you know, Zoom says, look, we got a much better product. Um, there's this open platform called the internet. We can deliver across it. 
Uh, we're going to move fast, be very focused, exploit that opportunity, but also, you know, Slack, Snap, da da da, da. <laughs> right? Actually, I think there's more of a challenge on mobile than there is on internet. It's more of a question of iOS and Google and like stores and so forth. Um, but you, you basically say, look, th this is a growing number and there's room for competition. Now, to the last point that you were mentioning, look, there's some Silicon Valley firms, there's a number of them that go, oh, I'd love to be acquired, it's a good outcome. But uh, Silicon Valley, uh, I think fortunately for the US and fortunately for the world, a lot of people here are very ambitious. Everyone's like, I want to establish the new platform. Um, the majority of the companies that I personally invest in have that as a goal and a characteristic. Um, I think that's generally true across a lot of the top tier venture firms. And so, um, and, and the thing that's interesting is now, we kind of have like multiple platforms that are interleaving. It's not just like one. It's not just like, you know, Windows is the only platform. We have internet as a platform. We have mobile as a platform. To some degree, cloud with artificial intelligence is another platform. And so you have these kind of platform uh, set of technologies, which then gives more space for creation of more, for the competition of it. Um, and so part of the reason why like Zoom comes about is neither uh, Google, which their modern product is called Meet, by the way, Hangouts is the kind of weird deprecated one. Um, it shows or, you where I am. <laughs> no, no, exactly. Or Microsoft Teams or Zoom, <laughs> right? Um, like, 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 like when Zoom was going, neither Microsoft nor Google were really focused on it until like Zoom had already built up an intense momentum and a product really going. And now, of course, by scrambling to compete, that's the competition that creates better products for society. Uh, and is part of the thing that is the, the insight of capitalism in providing value back to society. So can I just ask you, you said you're going from five to 10 rather than five to three. That was, you wanna, wanna let us in on the, the five you expect to grow? Uh, yeah, well, so I mean, exactly which ones I think is unclear. But like, for example, where will Salesforce end up? It's been growing, it's been acquiring a, a, you know, a bunch of things and it has a substantial market cap. Um, you, know, you could see, like, uh, depending pre-pandemic, because uh, basically once you get a, a, a tech company growth, it tries to grow into as many niches as it can. So if Uber weren't dealing so intensely with its drop of passenger vehicles, it would be you know, kind of similarly you know, kind of operational in this. Um, you know, we have a whole bunch of companies that are competing for what is the platform for autonomous vehicles. Obviously, yeah, yeah. Google is there with Waymo, but the investments I've made in, in Aurora and Neuro um, as, as kind of as, 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 as uh, super interesting and, and leading elements of this. So I think there's a stack of things like take uh, AI. So, you know, you've got these uh, mega giants, both in the U.S. and in and China, which, by the way, I think require a huge scale and uh, and in the the kind of the small fragmented firms basically don't succeed mostly on that but then of course you've got open AI uh, which is out there and 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 going really uh, going really well with this and so anyway so that's the reason why I'd say like the most of the oh my god they're so powerful that's an issue it was like well they're, they're defining the medium in which we're operating that medium is super important for the health of society, but actually, in fact, they're not, uh, they're not um, monopolar, <laughs> right? They're actually competing with each other and they're creating a bunch of space for other startups that are up and coming. So let, let's turn to the social justice side of things. I mean, we've got twin pandemics uh, and the, um, you know, there are a number of ways in which I think people worry uh, or, or argue that the the tech companies, big and small, are um, making racial inequities much worse. Right. So there are. So let's just start. There was a story in the New York Times about you know about the guy who was picked up because of facial recognition software, an African American man. We know that facial recognition works much better on whites than on people of color. Uh, you know, this guy's actually picked up and taken to jail, and he finally says no. So. The whole, there, there's the whole issue of algorithmic bias, which we, we know is you know, the people who make the algorithms. Again, this goes to uh, you know, not being able to ask, ask Alexa or, or uh, Siri about you know, rape. Is, uh, what, what do you, there are all sorts of examples. But then there's also the sort of 
tremendous divide in terms of jobs, right? The really good tech jobs, the really bad gig economy or just plain service jobs. Uh, and that that's disadvantaging people of color who are already at the bottom of the educational heap. And this is just making that, uh, that much uh, worse. Uh, and, then, and then related, of course, to algorithmic bias is just the, this is uh, Silicon Valley is, has tremendous racial disparities and you are starting to see people, you know, agitating from within. So is this a moment that really impels tech to change? I mean, all of us, I run an institution, you're on the board of it, we are looking at how do we really transform ourselves? How do we make sure, as you said, this time around, we're not looking 50 years from now and saying, oh yeah, there was a big civil rights movement in 2020 and you know, there was a little, now schools are more segregated than they were in 1970. How does tech grapple with this? So um, look, it's my ardent hope and also work, and I think yours and New America's as well, that now that we're in kind of the civil rights um, moment too, that we will actually go and get some more substantial progress on this uh, versus the kind of a, oh, look, it'll kind of work out and it's, and, and that's fine. And I think that one of the reasons why I think that the modern language of saying it's important to be an anti-racist, not just not a racist is correct, is because this is one of those problems where if you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. So if you're kind of sitting around quietly saying, look, I took my hidden bias training and I make sure that I interview proportionately for positions across, you know, gender, people of color and so forth. And in, and, and I'm, I'm making sure that I'm kind of cross checking our policies are modern. So look, I'm doing my part and that, that's it. And the system will ultimately work out. The problem of course is this allows those key places which are systemically biased against uh, a disenfranchised class um, or those, those um, number of people who are bad actors who are working within the system who create that oppression, right? So, you know, the, whether or not they're, they're police officers who had multiple infringements who are like, okay, I, 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 I'm always using terrible force against, you know, black people and black men. Um, and I'm, you know, whether it's because of public unions or because of policies or anything else, I'm, I'm allowed to keep doing it. Uh, and it's like, no, 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 that creates an environment of fear and terror. And it's part of the the, the, the overall uh, disenfranchisement of the class. And so we all have to be working on that. And that, that is true, obviously, for the tech industry as well. Um, and you know, there's, there's a set of things within the kind of philanthropic set. So it's everything from, as you know, Opportunity at Work, which is you know, kind of spun up within New America with Byron Aguist, is kind of making sure that we have uh, kind of diverse inclusion within tech jobs and making sure that there is a path for getting those skills, getting those jobs, and being part of the economic growth and the economic wealth that is created within these to make sure that that's you know, kind of broad within uh, distribution uh, of folks. Uh, Hadi Partovi's uh, code.org, let's make sure that uh, computer science is taught in every single high school, including every single, like every single public high school, every single uh, high school in, in the poorer communities, which of course frequently overlap with communities of color. And let's make sure that's there and so that opportunity is there. Uh, you know, there's a various organizations within within uh, Silicon Valley, like uh, Code 2040 and other things that are like, okay, let's make sure that those tech, tech things are there. Then when you get to the tech companies, I think that one of the things that, you know, is really good is that the tech companies are now thinking, okay, so how do I disproportionate, like how do I target to make sure that recruiting is working? How do I go to uh, historic black universities and colleges? You know, how do I you know, how do I do these things? How do I make that happen more? Um, and how do I make sure that there's the right support groups so it doesn't just like the, like the, like the voice can be heard within the organization. And I think that, I see that in every organization I'm touching, so I think it's really, really awesome. Um, you know, the CEOs are committing, uh, are committing. So now getting to the tech and the algorithmic side. Yeah. Um, clearly, I actually think that the facial recognition one, while it's obvious and visible to do, like, okay, they, they trained on all these corpus of white faces and, and all these other shitty things that, that lead to the, the bad training because of that. The more deep ones are like, for example, and this is not really AI, but, um, but within machine learning is like, what happens in parole judgment software or yes. sentencing recommendation software, which is really hard to, to cross check. And then when people have done uh, the work, they realize that actually, in fact, because it's, it's going over the heavily policed, you know, kind of 
black subcommunity that it's being it's inst it's hardening biases hardening injustice in that arena and you go okay that really needs to not happen like it's already it's already operational and that needs to be changed like today yesterday <laughs> tomorrow is too late and so um and so i think there's a set of things there and i think one of the things that's good is all with the attention is like okay um if you want to be deploying um uh software systems that have economic impact or social justice impact you need to proactively prove that you are good <laughs> right on the civil rights vectors you have to prove this say we're actually cross-checking to see if there's racial bias or cross-checking to see if there's gender bias and you know that will require some work from society which numerical will probably be the the, the sphere of to say well what what is the test bed what does the algorithm look like what are the kinds of things that say no no actually in fact even if that judgment happens to judge against you know this specific class that's that's actually in fact okay out of all the data sources right or no the moment that you have any disparity from a demographic average right you have a problem with your algorithm you have a right? problem. How do you, and how do you do that? And that's going to be super important to do. Now, the good news is of this is uh, the bad news is if you institutionalize parole, like judgment software, you can institutionalize racism across the entire country in one piece of software being distributed. That's the terrible news, which is really important. The good news is when you fix it, you can also be like, pushing back and being anti-racist across the whole society. And it's one of the reasons why I still tend to be a, uh, call it a techno optimist, not a techno utopian. What you build in technology is not necessarily the right values, but you can do things that are substantially better by doing it. And that's the work that I think we wanna take in this, this kind of civil rights movement too, in order to say, that's the thing that we need. And the good news is, as far as I can tell across all the tech companies that I'm, you know, have any relationship with, they go, yeah, that sounds like a really good idea. We should do that. You can actually imagine something like a lead certification system, right? With with various kinds of, of tech where you actually have an anti-racist filter uh, or a civil, just, civil, civil rights and civil justice uh, filter. So that there are questions coming in, but I want to ask you just a couple more. One is, you know, when you were talking about the civil rights movement, I, I went to college at the very, really at the end, I'm in the seventies, but, um, I cut my teeth uh, on divestment in South Africa, You're marching around uh, the uh, pre the sort of center of the administration. I mean, this was the late eight, um, 70s, and of course, uh, it takes another decade. But I, you know, I'm looking at what's happening with Facebook right now. The the drop in advertising uh, revenue over Facebook's you know, decision not to take Trump's tweets down, I mean, to mark them in some ways, but basically not to respond in ways that internally, they've got, a, there's an employment issue, like, I, you know, people from the inside saying, act, uh, you know, becoming more and more activists. But really what is striking is suddenly advertisers undoubtedly responding from pressure among their employees saying, we're not going to advertise. Could this be like a divestment moment? Um, it could, it could, could escalate. Um, and I do think that, by the way, some of the employees within the advertisers who are, who are pulling down, probably there are some movement there. I actually think that this is a, this is a good corollary, just as, as the anti-apartheid movement is a good corollary to the social movements. Because I actually think what the social movements went and realized is say, well, actually, in fact, there's all these companies that spend a lot of money on their brand. Part of their brand has to be Look, we are we are we are, we are society positive. We are we are race positive. We are gender positive. We, these are things that matter. Like we 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 go ten out of ten on goodness in these vectors, and they went to them and said, "Look, you're 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 advertising um, on a system which is allowing a, a, a range of hate speech that's much worse than you'd like. Um, it's it's uh, some of that speech might be." Uh, juxtaposed to your advertising, you know, is this really where you want your brand to be? I think that's the actual, the central, uh, the central movement uh, of this. Hmm. And I think they, you know, a bunch of the companies kind of went, yeah, <laughs> right. Uh, 
I, that, that's not what I want to be associated with. And I think that kind of, uh, of movement, it's one of the, the, the kind of boycott movements um, against uh, mm -hmm. kind of like organizations that is actually, I think, one of the things that is a classic kind of Western, American and European, you know, effort that by which people express their, their change, the change in values on an economic uh, basis. And I think that's, that's like happening in a good way. And frankly, on a political side, you know, one of the things I've been thinking about trying to go um, uh, stimulate uh, for the, you know, next month is, uh, is an anti-Trump boycott, you know, uh, because it's kind of like, okay, the, 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 the various forms of enrichment with Mar-a-Lago and all the rest that should not be part of an American uh, political system should be protested in an economic ways as well as political ways. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, that's what I actually, that's from what I, I'm not a deep student of that, that's what I see happening. And I think that is effective uh, in various ways because as they say, look, we, uh, we're only going to put our brands in places that have a, um, you know, essentially reflect the values of the brand that we want. And if we believe that kind of the, the, the boycott movement saying, like, uh, the hate speech regulation here is not good enough, <laughs> right? Then we're going to act, and I think that's what you see happening. And now, how? I, like, I hope that it makes uh, certain changes, but I think that's like TBD. The depth of the changes so far. Yep, yep. Although it is interesting because the classic boycott is a straight consumer one. This is more of a you know again the employee. You're, a, you're a, a company and you need to keep your employees on side. So it isn't just the consumers, it's actually you, people who can operate through their own organizations. Um, but Andrew, just because it's super important, it's also you need to keep your brand aligned a certain yeah, way yeah. to your entire, not just your employees, to Every the world and to all the consumers. And we're going to highlight where you're misaligning your brand. Okay. Oh. Yep. Maybe we won't advertise there. Yep, it's, it's, it's interesting. Okay, so one last question and I'll turn to the to questions from the audience. Um, so my, there, even before COVID, there were articles sort of the end of, uh, 29, uh, of, of 2019 saying, Richard Florida wrote one saying, you know, uh, young people are starting to move to a whole group of medium-sized cities that have highly educated workforces, uh, at that point, high uh, employment, that, that, that has changed, uh, lower cost of real estate, and there are, there are a whole list of uh, some in the heartland, some in, a lot in the southwest, but these are not the kind of Austin, Boston, Silicon Valley, Seattle, Denver, concentrated geography of jobs. And now you have remote work, Facebook is saying, and Twitter, you know, we, we expect that 50% of our people will, will keep working remotely. That's a dramatic change from campuses. Uh, and indeed, you know, Microsoft, huge campus, LinkedIn has a nice campus. Um, suddenly those engineers can actually move back to where many of them were trained, which is the Midwest. It's Michigan and Purdue and, and Illinois. They've got kids, their, ki their parents are aging, the good reason to be closer, uh, and the quality of life is much higher. So my question is, are we finally going to see a meaningful shift in what Moretti calls the, ge the new geography of jobs, which has not only in, increased inequality, but of course has created huge problems for those cities. I mean, homeless, homelessness and traffic and high housing prices all, all interlinked in various ways. So um, I think the answer is we will see something of a shift. Um, I think that shift uh, will be uh, somewhat enabled, especially because you know, part of during the pandemic, we'll get a reset by which a bunch of people will move and will adjourn, and then the organizations will adapt to having offices, work, et cetera, there, and that'll be positive. Now, that, that being said, I don't think the pandemic shifts the reason why we have what I think of as the densification of networks, which essentially leads to the urbanization anyway, which is uh, what happens as we live in more and more of a networked world, you know, kind of the networked age, right. uh, actually, in fact, being close to the center nodes of the network is super important for 
economics, economic opportunity, uh, power and influence, um, kind of position within whatever tribe you're talking. And a tribe could be, you know, a country, a tribe could be a company, a tribe could be a group, you know, whatever that is. And so that will continue. And I don't think that we have, I don't think that the, the fact that we will have now been kind of forced to develop our markets through, you know, a lot of Zooms and Teams and Meets and so forth, that those principles of, of relation, relational uh, kind of um, uh, combination within tribes for it and the proximity, even though proximity through these Zoom things is farther out, proximity still really matters. Uh, that's the reason why if you look at what the engines of economic growth uh, tend to be, especially within new firms and technology and else, it tends to be within urban areas. Yes, we get some energy things and we get, you know, kind of natural resources and some other things. But by the way, when you get to like, okay, we're now inventing new energy, well, that tends to be uh, centers of jaggery. The same thing that generates universities. Are. It's you, you get an aggregation of a, of a certain kind of nodes of networks uh, and connections to certain other nodes, and that's what drives it. And so that those forces are still there. Uh, it may be that the absolute intensity of the forces has been diminished some by the development of tools, the, the, the realization of the value of having uh, distributed nodes. I myself have been working in a lot of ways to create entrepreneurship in places outside of Silicon Valley, you know, within the U.S. and globally. It's Endeavor, it's Kiva, it's a whole stack of things because I think the more entrepreneurial hubs we have, the better off we are as a society. Um, I think that's actually a super important thing. Uh, and that's just one area of it. I think the same thing is true of having multiple areas of doing science, multiple areas of doing tech, multiple areas, like this is, this is like a really good thing. Uh, but it's too easy for us to draw the straight line and say, oh, look, this has got to reset. So now it's totally different. You're like, no, no, the same forces that lead to why there is so much new tech company creation in Silicon Valley will continue to create that kind of uh, tech combination uh, within Silicon Valley. We want to create as many others as possible, um, but the forces are still there. Interesting. All right, we've got lots of questions and you've got some tough ones uh, or just really excellent questions. So one from Rebecca McKinnon, uh, a Washington Post editorial on Monday criticized both Trump and Biden for having the wrong position on wanting to revoke Section 230 for different reasons, uh, which as you well know, shields internet platforms from liability for what their users do. So they both want to, to uh, uh, revoke it, different reasons. Uh, the question is, if Vice President Biden were to ask you for your advice on what his policy should be uh, on internet platform regulation, specifically 230, what would you tell him? So, <laughs> let's see, I, I'll, I'll make a couple of first comments. So one is the funny way that, that and 230 obviously is the, uh, we don't edit, editorialize and and don't uh, monitor it, then we're free from the, uh, uh, the accountability and the liability of things that, are, things that are said. And the short answer, by the way, is we actually already uh, forced the platforms to do some monitoring. The, oh, we don't do monitoring. They monitor for porn and child porn. They monitor for terrorism. They monitor for, um, you know, kind of uh, commercially uh, bad speech, including like copyright violation and, and some other things. They got monitoring functions, right? So the 230 as no monitoring function is this one, this weird illusion that everyone talks about. The real question is just where do you set the lines? And where do you set the lines between saying, hey, look, we're gonna enable um, as actually broadly diverse speech as possible. And we're gonna say, no, no, you're, you're, you're responsible for this in the traditional way that publishers are responsible, <laughs> right? And so every single speak piece of content is as if you paid for it and it was your employee who put it up out of your organization, uh, which of course is where media would like because they would like it all to be like them, <laughs> right? And so uh, and the question is, is where in that, in that line? And I think that the answer is, look, what we should, the, the real dialogue in this case is, is where should we say, here is the places where we should say um, in these forms, you have some less restrictive than publisher live, le less absolute than publisher liability, but more than no liability. And here is what those should look like so that we have the better balance of things. 
Um, because by the way, we're already doing that. Even though 230 says, well, you know, like, like you don't monitor, don't, you, you, you're not watching and you're not editing actively, so you don't have accountability. Well, the answer is they are watching and they are editing, right? Because they're already doing it for very, very selective things that everyone goes, hey, yeah, every, like everybody should do that, of course. So that's the mods that should happen. Now, broadly speaking, um, I think that part of the virtue of the American entrepreneurial system, the virtue of the American free speech system, is we say restrictions on these things, we, cho we, we choose them very carefully, right? As opposed to saying, we have a centralized bureaucracy that makes all these decisions for us. We say, look, we try to allow the, the system, including crazy people, people who think we never went to the moon and so forth. We allow crazy people, <laughs> right? Um, but that's because we wanna make sure that we're not locking down what we can discover, the, 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 the new important thing that might otherwise be eliminated by a central bureaucracy. So you wanna be very choiceful about how you move it out but I think some choices of how to move it out are good things. Now, obviously I think both the reasons, you know, just as Rebecca said, hi Rebecca, um, both, both, uh, you know, both of those two positions seem to be badly put from an American values perspective. Okay, so we've got a, an interesting question from Esther Dyson. It says, do employees in tech companies matter more than shareholders? In other words, will human capital supersede financial capital? Are we going to move from to talentism? Well, the, the human and financial capital is a whole other thing that we could spend a whole hour talking about. Classic <laughs> in-depth Esther question. Um, the and hi Esther. The um, and so what I would say is broadly speaking, I think it's always been the case that to some degree, uh, companies are more responsive in some ways to employees than shareholders partially because shareholders as a block tend to be, we have one fairly easily measurable mechanism, which is, are you leading the business in a way that increases the value of the stock? Like you're increasing revenue, you're increasing, uh, you're increasing operating margin, uh, you're operating ways your brand is increasing, the belief in the future relative to competitors. And that tends to be the, the totalizing factor across all of them. And when, and when, and, uh, barring very large malfeasance, like whether it's climate change or, you know, bad interactions, uh, you know, globally, like, you know, suppressing indigenous communities or other kinds of things that are like, okay, you know, this, we can create a, a thing that, that tars the whole company. Um, stockholders tend to have that shape. Whereas employees tend to be the, well, we work here, we choose to work here, uh, you hear our voices all the time, our degree of morale and, and, and willingness to work really hard and, and do innovation and invest in the future of the company really, really matters. And so I think it's actually, frankly, more revealed now in weird ways because it because this kind of loop for like, it's easier for, for employees to do a walkout, for example, or a virtual walkout to express their, their point of view um, but I think that's kind of broadly speaking always been the case. And I think that um, in a sense, one of the things where the trend line's going is where you get to, you know, MBA schools and leadership schools is actually, that I think there's going to be need to be more attention put to this because I think it's part of how you create actually really great companies is, is, is where they, the culture and the employees are like, we're working for the mission. Like there's a mission to this company about what it's doing in the world and we're doing that. And that naturally goes to, I'm not sure if talentism is the right word, but I think it goes in that direction. I think that there are many good things with it, even though there's also some really kind of weird things with it too. So I've got a question here from Baldas. This is back on, on sort of tech and social justice. So Robert Smith has suggested uh, take 2% of a business's bottom line and put it to work for minorities. Uh, j just it, Netflix did this this morning. It gave a percentage of its bankable monies to minority run banks. So is this what tech should do? Just take a, you know, a, a fixed percentage and say, we are going to affirm, as you said, race positive. We're going to do something that affirmatively helps uh, minorities. Well, I'm not surprised that uh, Robert Smith has a super smart um, uh, suggestion. Uh, I interviewed him for Masters of Scale. That's how I got to know him. Uh, uh, very, very smart man. And I think that's a good idea. I think it's a good idea to say, um, look, well, part of the, because 
Because part of, of course, how you begin to really, like an American way to systemically think about how do we change racial justice is to say, well, let's be co-owners. Let's make sure that they have not just, you know, kind of like economic opportunities and paths, but if they're co-owners of society, they're bought into it along with everyone else. It's the same reason why we, we value home ownership and we value like community ownership. It's like, okay, so let's make the financial institutions that help elevate the, 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 the black community and, 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 and we want, it'll be a, such a better society if they're co-owners with it. So it's, a, it's an excellent idea. And actually, in fact, I'll talk to Robert about it next time I talk to him. <laughs> um, so then a question from Mia Armstrong, this is back to China. Uh, any thoughts on how TikTok plays into all this? Uh, what's to credit for its huge success, particularly over the last few months? I can tell you that we're all sitting on screens. Uh, but uh, does that say anything about the future of Chinese tech companies in the U.S. market? Well, I think we're beginning to see it. So previously, like five, ten years ago, the where Chinese companies were very strong, but where they were dominant was China. And now we're beginning to see them going other places. And TikTok, I have some knowledge of because actually that came from a, a investment that Greylock made in a Shanghai company, and there were other investors too, but we were investors uh, called Musically, um, which which uh, generated uh, TikTok, and it's now part of um, ByteDance. And um, and so uh, I think that what you're going to see is you're going to see more app, not just innovations, because there are innovations coming out of China that U.S. tech firms actually go, oh, that's good, and the way tech competition happens is not only do we copy it, but we take it and we rebuild, we build the next version of it. That's, that's the, the progress of this kind of competition. And I think you'll see that. And I think you'll see, uh, you've already been seeing that, but now you actually see presence of these uh, platforms, presence of these, of, these, uh, of these applications. And I think you'll see more and more of it. Uh, and yes, we don't see as much of it within the US uh, because we have a strong kind of tech industry. It isn't the most natural place for the Chinese firms to most often go. Where they most go and compete is the rest of the world. And like, for example, areas where the US tech industry is failing very badly is in the payments OS for the rest of the world. This tends to be Alipay. And actually, in fact, you say, well, what, what might determine the future of a reserve world currency right? Because we all go, we, we live in this very comfortable spot where the dollar is the reserve world currency. Well, actually, in fact, tech, it may be the thing that changes that. And it may be the fact that when, the, when it's a Chinese tech platform in the entire rest of the world that does all the payments infrastructure, that may just go, well, look, we've got to automatically shift to the RMB. That's the reserve world currency. And by the way, that would change the economic futures of absolutely everyone in the United States, as an example, <laughs> right? We, we, we have this fortune more than, you know, that, that benefits us more than every other country in the world because of the reserve world currency. And so I actually think that the, what's really going on, most Americans, like you see TikTok, but actually in fact, that's already massively going on in all of the rest of the world. And um, you know, that's a game that, um, you know, like I'd say many Silicon Valley people think we can be in that game, but by default, that's part of the reason I was like, leave us alone, let us compete with China, which is not, look, we should care about society and all the rest. But like, if you don't do that, we're going to lose. And that, 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 that won't just affect the tech companies, that will affect the entire country. All right, well, that leads perfectly uh, to the next question, uh, which says, it seems people might agree with you that we need to occupy the primary technological position if we want to have any real influence. Uh, but it, uh, of late, it doesn't seem that we're sufficiently using that position to advance the values we hold dear. How should we do that better? Great question. Um, so, of course, the, the really top level asterisk is have more unity in a society and a country, right? Which is like, how the hell do you do that? Because uh, given like how much, like, like part of the problem about having a, a president who is, who is uh, divide and conquer, who is, who is discord in chief, uh, leads to enormous repercu repercussions across the entire thing. We definitely want to have kind of like, look, how do we get to the basis where we're working together and have more unity? And by the way, that starts with a Congress. Like we're fundamentally a Congress run country. And so you have to work on the Congress and you have to improve unity of relationship with the Congress. What are the things we agree on in order to make those things happen? And whether that's ranked choice voting, tying electoral vote, the popular vote, all these kinds of structural things, all of that's super important. 
Now, within the technology space, I think the, the, it comes down to us saying, look, we think that the following things are the values of America, both internally and also what we want to advocate globally. And then, then for example, you could, this is one of the things that when I was talking to the Obama administration, which was you know, very forward looking and discourse on this, I say, look, I would start opening up uh, discourse. I'd start with discourse with the tech companies saying, look, this is this kind of stuff we care about. What can you do to help with it, <laughs> right? And by the way, if you can't do things to help with it, then we have to start regulating. We have to start saying, look, we're gonna start oppose, uh, up imposing accountancy-driven metrics for you on certain kinds of things. Like say, for example, we want the reduction of hate speech within your platform. We're gonna use AI to do sentiment analysis in the following way. And if you're not showing your metrics going down on hate speech year by year, this is the kind of financial penalty that's gonna result from it. You know, which is something you could you know, kind of easily do. There's a lot of detail on that in order to get it right, but there's stuff you could do. But I think you start with, hey, you guys are the innovators. These are the things we care about. What can you do for us? What can you do to make that happen? Because by the way, you might be surprised at like, oh, a much better idea. The problem is the old fangled regulation was thou shalt only do the following thing in the following process. The problem, of course, is we're evolving and changing. And when you do that, you lock in the past against the future. You need to continue to innovate. So do it against targets, do it against things that you measure and say, hey, how you get there is how you get there, but these are the metrics that you do it against. And that's the kind of thing that I think is the discourse that needs to happen between essentially the government, the public institutions and the, and the companies, the, te the technology companies, all companies. So we have all, uh, two minutes. Um, so I'm going to ask a question. Um, do you believe that the U.S. will be the hub of global tech innovation in 25 years? From Victoria Jackson. Huh. Um, I think that we're strong enough and we have enough of, even though we're trying desperately to kill ourselves on this, um, like, for example, the superpower of America is immigration. Um, it's one of the things that, for example, when you say, well, what would be the theses by which this would be true against China, for example, is that we continue to do a, hey, we're a great place for people and bright minds to come from around the world, participate in the universities, participate in the startups, participate in the tech companies, and that's our superpower. And that, if, if we are doubling down on that superpower, I think the answer is yes. If we continue to do what we're doing, which is to say, oh, let's actually, in fact, take the thing that we have the best competitive edge when you consider us against China, when you consider us against Russia, when you consider us against any of these other forces, and let's actually systemically break it. Let's, let's break our, our position. Let's make it, let's make ourselves like ferociously xenophobic and anti-immigrant. Let's make ourselves anti the Statue of Liberty then I think that there's a good there's a good possibility of the answer to that question is no. That is not a good techno optimist and note to end on, but it, it is our. I think we can do it, but we need to like row in the right direction, and I'm kind of guessing this is the way we need to row. Great, and I would say uh, yes, embracing the way we both reflect and connect the world and frankly addressing our own unity problems but race problems uh, there's no, there's no way otherwise so reed hoffman thank you thanks to the audience there were great questions there were more than i could ask uh, and thanks to slate and asu and again our tech staff and faith smith and andres martinez who make this happen uh, and tori bosch on the slate side so thanks all thank you